Dear Christian, we discussed doing a project together, long distance, and now that you're back home, I'm sending you some photographs. I take pictures of the ground and variations on that theme. I've attached a few to see if this begins something between us. All of my pictures are about Los Angeles and about my relationship with the city. You will see one photo that pictures a Guyton and Walker catalog. Last New Year's Eve, I took the catalog on a road trip and photographed it for a series I did for my blog, Notes on Looking. Most of these photographs are relatively anonymous with the places, and some, while being anonymous, are related to my own experiences. I have begun to name these pictures for the place that I am visiting or walking, but for the most part I leave them unnamed. And I'm kind of laughing at myself, because they are all related to moments of uncertainty. I appreciate their blankness, and I love the specificity of each image. Age, time, details, weather, history, emotion, all these things are present if hidden in plain sight. The ground is great. I hope to hear back from you soon, Christian. Bye. Dear Jeff, thank you so much for these images. I really like them. It's interesting that on the one hand they seem to work like a mapping of the city, of Los Angeles, and then on the other hand they seem to be something very personal for you because you have this long relation to the city where you were born and you grew up. So I guess you spend a lot of moments in the past at the spots that you photographed now. So I think there's an interest in layers of time and history that we definitely share here. And it will be nice to go a bit deeper into that. There's just one thing that I didn't understand so well. Uh, it's this thing with the catalog that you put on the ground. Can you tell me a bit more about this idea? What is the relation of this book to the ground for you? Okay, I'm looking forward to hearing back for you and send you all my best wishes. Bye. Dear Christian, once again, the catalog came in over, the, over a series of posts on my blog. In the posts, the ground began to play something of a role. It was a way of placing myself and the reader too. In one post, I place the catalog on the ground and it becomes a character and almost like landscape itself. And for me, landscape is psychological and has power. I suppose I sent you the picture with the catalog because the series of posts associated with it are among my favorites. I hope this answers that question and, and I look forward to more. Bye. Hey Jeff, I finally had time to read your post and it's really great. And while I was reading it, I had the idea to send you back some pictures of mine that I thought would be a really nice counterpart to yours. Because in a way our pictures seem to be related, although the approach behind it is pretty different. So maybe it's interesting to bring these two series together and just discuss them a bit. It's been a few years ago that I started a series of photographs in foreign places that I had visited only for a short time and that seemed culturally pretty different to my normal surrounding. So as I was a short time visitor I thought about possibilities to get closer to the, these unknown cities without sticking to the touristic gaze which is always so restricted. And so I decided to hire an agent which knows the city very well but which would not be aware of making pictures while moving through the city. So in these series, which I had realized in two cities by now, one being Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia and the other being Oaxaca in Mexico, consists of photographs that were made by stray dogs. Because both of these cities are populated by thousands of stray dogs. And to me, they seem to be the perfect agents for achieving this task. So basically I was mounting a camera on their necks and these cameras automatically took a picture every 90 seconds. So you could say that these photographs that result uh, document a unique perspective of an animal as it wanders through the city. And of course the physical presence of the dog can be sensed in, in all of the pictures. Sometimes you can see its hair and there's uh, many slanted views of the ground because the dog's sniffing on the ground. And this is why many of these pictures kind of look similar to the ones that you made, which I like very much. So, because the series is kind of determined by the seeming incalculability of a dog's perception, it seems to be devoid of any aesthetic pretension or intended composition. It's more like uh, it's trying to find a direct approach to a place 
which we would otherwise be incapable of realizing. So in a way it's almost the opposite approach to yours, which is related to a very personal view and to a known ground and reflecting memories of the past through photographing it. In my case it's more the attempt to get closer to an unknown place by trying to achieve almost unconscious photographs. But there are many pictures of the ground, as I said, and I'm very interested in what you think about it. So let me know soon and I send you my best wishes. Bye. Dear Christian, as I navigate my neighborhood walking and reading these lines, I become more and more aware of how sound travels through the city. An annoying and fretful sound from one street bounces off the face of a building and follows me as I walk along a perpendicular road. Um, I can't seem to get away from it. However, pushing forward. I read about this stray dog project of yours some time ago, and I really love it. It's so funny. I had no idea that you are the artist behind this clever idea. I really identify with those photos. They feel as though filled with purpose, but not an identifiable one. Of course, once I read the procedure, I can tell myself a story about them. But still, the way you have chosen to focus my attention is so indirect. Hmm. I am not implicated in the looking by my own, nor by your choices. Do you feel that you got closer to these unknown places through these means? What did you learn about Oaxaca and Ulaanbaatar? It seems to me that your lack of intent in the making of these in the making of these getting lost pictures might allow you to view them without seeing yourself. Choosing places, and in the case of photography, choosing when to strike, makes it difficult to see without also recalling the moment of choice. Is this what you were trying to avoid? Having just written this makes me think how very autobiographical my own pictures of the ground might be. Eek! It is all about me, as some therapists would have it. P.S. My own looking at the ground originally was an attempt at deflection. Like you with the dogs, I too was looking for unknown places. My reasons involved safety and comfort. Why did you seek these unconscious pictures of unknown places? Until the next time, Christian. Bye. Dear Jeff, let me try to answer some of your questions. Now, basically, I am very interested in how we approach places. So what does it mean to be in a certain place, at a certain moment, and how do we recognize that we are here and not there? Because we are continually occupied with actualizing and synchronizing our relation to the surrounding present, right? But in a way we learn how to adopt to these situations, and we establish systems or modes in which we learn to filter out most of the perceptions in order to gain control over the otherwise overloading reality that we face. So here, by using the dog as an agent, I kind of make a step away from myself, from my habits, from my restrictions and from my borders of imagination and from my fear to go to specific places, etc., etc. Of course, it's still me that puts the whole thing into action, but after that, my influence is gone. So, to answer your question, yes, I was trying to get away from these decisions. Like, where to make a photograph, of what and when. Because taking pictures of places always creates this distance between oneself and the place. Or at least it's how I experience it most of the times. So, in a sense, this brought me closer to the place as I had to look at it from a totally different perspective. It's a bit like watching a film by the Japanese filmmaker Ozu, uh, which has the camera always filming from the perspective of a sitting person which is confusing for non-Japanese viewers which don't share the same cultural background. And on the other hand, of course, this project was also challenging the idea of travel photography and, and all the history that is connected with it. I mean, to travel to a place and then take pictures of it and then bring them home and give other people an impression of how it is there. I mean, this is such a subjective endeavor with all the restrictions of the photographer being in a place that he or she doesn't even really know well. So I, I kind of asked myself, how could I avoid that and still make pictures? And why shouldn't I be helped by someone, or in this case a dog, 
that knows the place very well, but that makes no choices that are related to the photographs. But of course, there still are some decisions being made, like how often would the camera make pictures, or where would I mount it on the dog, or which dog do I choose, etc. So, in that sense, I think the photos are maybe just as much about me as your pictures are about you, but in a very different way. Yours are very personal in a direct sense, of course. You, you put your legs or your shoes in the pictures, almost as if you would say, here I am, and I'm connected to that specific ground. So, as I was speaking a lot about decisions and avoiding them, how do you decide for your pictures? Is it spontaneous or do you really look for these pictures? And, and, and do you look through the camera when you shoot or is it just shot out of the hand without framing it specifically? Because in a way it's interesting that we both were attempting to get a different view onto a place, but in your case, contrary to mine, it's onto a city that you know pretty well and that is very familiar. So, how personal is your relation to this specific ground? Does it evoke memories of your past? Or do you look for traces of history on the ground or for manifestations of subjects that inhabit uh, these places? I send you all my best wishes and bye. Hello again, Christian. Your lack of choosing drew me to the agent dog photos when I first saw them. Given my voracious attitude about picking up influences, they may have helped me understand how not to make perfect pictures. You are correct that my photo project is quite personal. Paying attention to the streets, sidewalks, and the ground in Los Angeles has been a part of my life much longer than I've been making photographs. And although the practice has evolved, it began as a strategy to deal with shame, and shame remains a force on it still. This shame comes from a variety of possible human sources sexual activity, unwanted attention, etc. Before I bought a camera, when I felt a flash of shame, I would look at the ground to deflect or avert it. This would dis distract the shame's focus from me, as well as distract me from feeling ashamed. Wow. Helicopter. Constant. Thanks, buddy. Just go away. Early on, I found myself making aesthetic judgments of what I saw. I would pick up an interesting piece of metal or wood, a rock or broken glass or plastic. It is important to me that these objects lacked an imposed narrative. They seemed free from the intent of others. Underline that sentence. And just as I was grateful to find safety in the emptiness they offered, I thought that these interesting objects might appreciate me paying them attention. Now I have a camera, and I'm more, more evolved than I was 20 or 30 years ago. I take photographs to explore and celebrate that past. I'm kind of laughing because I still have shame to deal with, and, as in the past, I look at the ground. In that moment, I will find abstractions in the cracks, angles, and differences in surface texture. It seems that we are both working outside of choice. You are choosing not to choose, whereas I am driven by need. You write about being and recognition in relation to place, and later you offer that you can see from a totally different perspective. What do you notice when you look at the dog pictures? What does this perspective teach you? It seems to me that we both are getting away from photographing identifiable places, and instead we give to viewers a sort of pregnant anonymity in the photos, meaning that in my photos there is a gesture toward abstraction and a serious consideration of plainness and of anti-glamour, a purposeful consideration of these things. In your dog photos, from my initial experience with them, I feel there is present some other intelligence. Something or someone is certainly taking the picture, but the criteria for choosing is not of my understanding. Sincerely yours, Jeff. Bye. Dear Jeff, you write that the choices are not of your understanding, but maybe in this series of pictures, and, and maybe even in yours, it's more about empathy than about understanding. It's very interesting that in both series the photographer's body is not absent from the images like in most other photographs. So in your case, having parts of your body in the image almost works like a grounding of yourself in the image, like a direct linking of your body and the sight and the image of it. And in my case, the pictures imply a bodily presence of something other than human. 
That's why I really like your term, pregnant anonymity. Because for me it implies an anonymous place being loaded with something that is accessible for the spectator only by empathy for the person being behind the camera. But there is a difference of course for a human being to feel empathy for another human or for a non-human other. So an interesting question would be how deep can we actually feel empathy with a dog? Because of course the dog's world presents a challenge to us because we're not capable of perceiving the environment totally in the same manner. So in this sense I'm here also confronted with the limitations of my seeing. I think in, in this work both the body through which the world opens up to us and the world that is seen are strange. So maybe what I was fascinated by is that these pictures ease me towards a situation or a suspense where what becomes visible is not me but my seeing, my own voyeurism and my curiosity to see what I cannot see, which also includes seeing myself seeing. I found it very interesting to read that shame was a factor that drew your attention to the ground because I think I know similar experiences from my past but I would rather describe it as an inattentive attention or maybe a subconscious attention. I look at the ground but I don't really look attentively because my thoughts are occupied by dealing with the moment of shame. And, and you describe it totally differently that the, the attention for some details on the ground take away your attention from the shame. So the question would be what made you photograph it later on? Was it an interest to investigate the spots more intensely when being back home? Or did you have the wish to share these spots or these moments with other people that you could show the pictures to? Let me know. All my best. Bye. Dear Christian, yes, empathy. Even as I strive toward understanding, I rely upon empathy to light my way. I began taking these pictures because I had a camera, which I hadn't in the past. This is what I told myself. Reflecting on the photographs that resulted, I found an emotional connection that I hadn't expected. I recalled the first time I allowed my body to also be pictured, and it was a revelation. There I was. I cannot be denied that I was present. Then I felt empathy for the stuff on the sidewalk looking all forlorn, as well as for the earlier me who had depended so openly on these non-spaces for protection. Investigate, yes, of course, and also share. I hesitate to admit that my feeling of not being seen in that distant past makes me want to share my presence now. This hesitation of mine may be a reflex that I shall discard, time will tell. Your statement, what becomes visible is not me, but my seeing, is beautiful, Christian. Good Lord, that is a wonderful way to phrase a thought. And with that, I leave you once again. Sincerely yours, Jeff.